The history of the world is often taught from a perspective of government powers. We've all heard it, that win and lose wars. But a great part of history is not about who won battles of armor or who took possession of what territory. I think, actually, the more important story about planet Earth and our development is the battle for ideas and for beliefs over what we think, either about the creator, about ourselves, about our relationships to one another, and to the biosphere. I mean, some people would say, are we really here just to work and pay taxes? Well, I don't think so. And our guest this hour has an extraordinary capacity to bring to a discussion a much broader view of world and world history. He is a Knights Templar, he's a genealogist, he's an expert historian, he's got all kinds of titles about the things that he is qualified to tell us about. He has written a number of books, Holy Grail, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, Realm of the King Lords, um, and other books which we will look at. Lawrence Gardner joins us, and Sir Lawrence Gardner is well known. He's currently working on a film project, which we will talk about, but mostly he joins us today to take a look at the history, the esoteric lineage of the Grail, the Ring Lords, the route of the Holy Ark of the Hebrews, and what all of this has to do with history and with where we are in the world and what our future might look like. What I think is important is that we learn history, but we very rarely learn from history. So we learn about it, but not from it. Uh, there is a lot now that's transpiring about the early history of nations in the Western world, which, act, which actually we're not taking notice of, and we're making the same mistakes over and over again. Welcome to Future Talk. I'm Zohara Hieronymus. At the voice of our current guest, Sir Lawrence Gardner, who when he joined us, oh, I don't know, maybe about half a year ago, we started this conversation, and I thought it's so important in his perspective so rich because of his um, knowledge that I knew no, uh, no one else really to have this discussion with. So, Sir Lawrence, thank you so much for being back. Hello, Zahara. It's good to be back on. Look, one of the things that you can do, and, and I gave you short shrift because your titles, people would say, well, what's a prior of the sacred kindred of St. Columba? Or what's a preceptor of the Knight Templars of St. Anthony? And then what's an attache to the Grand Protectorate of the Imperial Dragon Court of Hungary, 1408? I mean, your titles themselves sound like they're from an amazing storybook of the past. Well, I mean, they all sound terribly glamorous and romantic, and I suppose in some ways they are because of their tradition. But um, in essence, they're, they're, they're simply jobs that I do, and which carry those titles from previous times. Well, describe for us the job that you do do, because I did mention some of the books, and we've had the pleasure of discussing several of them on the program. What is it that you're looking at? What is this journey that Sir Lawrence Gardner is making as a historian? Well, it, it, it's um, it's an intriguing journey that I, I have no idea when I started it, to, to be really honest. I suddenly found myself on, on this road, and um, it, it seemed to happen at a point in time when a publisher said to me, you've got a book there, and I didn't know that I had, but it, it began with Bloodline of the Holy Grail. And then from that moment in time, I've sort of purposely be, been on a, a quest, I suppose, to, to discover histories that were written but, but haven't necessarily been taught, and, and there is a distinct difference um, between the two. I mean, in terms of the, 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 the various other jobs that I do with, with these titles, they're, they're mainly sort of historical and constitutional mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, you, you, there, there are constitutions in America, constitutions in, the, uh, in, in Canada, there are constitutions in various countries in Europe, and Britain doesn't have one, and not a written constitution as such. And yet Britain belongs to a European Union amid a, a number of other countries that do. And, and we have a, a sort of a central Brussels parliament that dishes out dictates and things. So, so my job within that is to, is to look at various constitutions and, and to see, you know, what, what can and what can't be implemented as, as a new law or dictate in this or that country. Um, so that's the job that I really do for the European Council of Princes, is the constitutional advisory role. So I, I sit here surrounded by all these constitutions and plans. It's very interesting. I mean, that would be... Well, it's very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's a chore sometimes. Well, I would think so. That was my own uh, passion for a decade, was the Constitution of the United States, yeah. and I felt that here was a design for a republic, which we really don't embody and don't live by, but mm. what a beautiful design. Now, having said that, and because you've written these books, Realm of the Ring Lords, Genesis of the Grail Kings, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, and Secrets of the Sacred Ark, it's almost as though 
what you have been uncovering are actually traditions that perhaps religions may point to but don't necessarily explore in the way you have. So what about this quote-unquote esoteric history? I mean, what are we to learn from our past? Well, I think the first lesson to learn is that um, in terms of our educational establishments, and they're the same there as they are here and in in most um, countries in in, in the West, really, you know, we, we, we are taught according to a a sort of a format, and um, it changes over time. You know, in England, we've had so many dynasties of, of reigning monarchs, and with each new dynasty uh, comes a new history of the previous dynasty, mm-hmm. and, and the, the old records sort of get put in cupboards and locked away, and, and suddenly they're the, they're the bad guys, and we're the good guys now, and, and a new sort of history gets taught. So in Britain, and, and as a spin-off in America, we're, we're, we're taught generally from a sort of a Georgian-type historical perspective. So... Um, it, it, I mean, it's not necessarily incorrect, but a lot of the truths are, are left out of it um, simply be, because of a, a, a base vested interest in, in it, some sort of national um, Right, in institutions, exactly. It seems that what gets left out, as you point to in your books, is that which empowers the individual to self-realization yeah. and to, to full embodiment of, of sort of human capacity. When you look, as you have, at the bloodline of the Holy Grail or, or the, the search for the Holy Grail, what does that tell us about our humanity? And, and how might it really give us a tool for our current, you know, the challenges we face as a humanity today? Well, the, the Holy Grail, I, I, you know, is a number of things. I mean, it's always had various physical and spiritual aspects, and there are various debates about what it is. But I, m- my feeling is that under all of these emblems and symbols, it's, it's a quest for something pretty ultimate that, that we're all looking for. And I suppose it, it, it's ultimate in as much as that, that we're, we're looking for a perfect management of some sort, you know, a, a national administrations that, that work for us and that sort of thing. Um, it, it, it seemed odd to me, in fact, when I looked back at, at the original uh, sort of Middle Ages use of the term grail, it had a code that went along with it, and a knightly order sort of had this. It was a grail code of equality and fraternity and all of those wonderful things from the French Revolution and, and whatever. But, but above all, it was said that it was a democratic uh, ideal. I, and I thought that's really interesting. And I, I looked up democracy in the dictionary, you know, as many of us don't do, but we, when we use the word, but, but we don't look up what it means. And it was, it was very, very specific. It, it, democracy, it says, is government by the people for the people. So, you know, in America and in Britain and everywhere else, we think we have a democratic system. But the more I thought about it and the more I looked into it, I thought, well, I don't know that we've ever had a government by people for people. We've mm-hmm. always had government of people. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it seems kind of strange that we, we invented a system whereby we elect people to represent us who quite suddenly, the moment they have these jobs, seem to represent everything against us <laughs> and start making rules and laws and things, you know, and... and they, they feel somehow or other they, they, they have some sort of superiority, whereas in fact they're our representatives. Yeah, it's an entitlement. They yeah, think for abuse right. rather than an obligation of service. Yeah, so it was that really that, that I, I started to look at. I, I thought, well, what, what we're looking here at is something which should be about guardianship and, and service and that sort of thing instead of reign and mm-hmm. rule, r- mm-hmm. rule and, and, and government and those sort of... I mean, government is, is the word that I, I really detest more than anything. You know, we shouldn't be governed, don't need governing. We need looking after, you know, and, and, and shielding and, and guiding and all of those things. Uh, and, and yet it seems that we, we've never actually put the right people in place ever to, to do these sort of jobs. And oh, I say ever, I mean, when, whenever it seems to have perhaps happened... Uh, the, the, the people in those roles have, been, have pretty short shrift. Yeah, they're generally executed the country, <laughs> in yeah. one way or another. Yeah. Um, and, and then, so then if one were to look, because what interests me is that you as a historian and as a practitioner in your own life of these beautiful ethics and precepts about self-refinement of the individual then are being able to actually do in the world in an appropriate fashion – by the covering up of these esoteric histories, it's as if, as you pointed out, the vested powers in history making, whether it's the institution of government or the institution of 
fraternities in the university don't really want people to know much about the interior quest that millions of people gave their lives for. Mm. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost indefinable as, as a concept. You know, I mean, I, I, I've discovered over the years because I've done lots of traveling, given lots of talks, done lots of radio phonies, all that sort of thing. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to discover that the best way uh, to, to be in some way taken seriously and, and respected, if that's a, a good word, is to, is to actually be seen to do the job that you're supposed to be doing on behalf of the people that you're doing it for. Uh, and, and yet what happens is that the, the, the reverse happens. You know, we don't see these people as, as sort of acting for us most of the time. Uh, I mean, the European Union is a prime example. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we elect people here to be our MPs in Europe, and then they suddenly become European MPs and mm-hmm. dictate back to us, which is kind of weird because our MP lives in a couple of roads away from me, and he wasn't an MP a few years ago. He was a farmer, you know, that, that sort right, of thing. Right, right. So, so, I, so I find it really odd, and I, I've never been quite sure what it is that makes that happen. And I had this sort of idea that maybe there was a room that they were taken into and they came out of the other side kind of cloned into this new <laughs> concept of being, you know. And, and as oath enough, is, I will I serve mean, myself. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? But the more I look at it, the more I can actually see that that kind of is it. Because what happens is that, that we give these people jobs that actually become such such influential positions Very powerful. that they really don't want to lose them, and then exactly. they be, suddenly become job frightened, you know? And, and their job then is not to serve us, but to look after their job. Lawrence, given that you have, uh, you are in an amazing position, really, of looking at the interior nature of mystery traditions throughout our history, ones that particularly affect Western civilization. And as you mentioned, also being very much a part of the European Union and looking at law and what regulates decision making. What kinds of structures were in place in terms of, you started to mention with the Templars, decision making within the Templar society versus, as an example, what goes on in our Western world today. I mean, how how has the inner tradition sort of been lost to the outer execution? Well, t- Templar society uh, had an interesting beginning, actually, and it's not a, a beginning that many people seem to understand too well. What happened was that uh, the, 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 the Templars as a, as a unit, as a group in the Middle Ages, actually sort of... Uh, came into being during the First Crusade. Uh, and this was a, a point in time when, when everybody from France and, and the Flemish countries and some from Britain and whatever were, were, were over there in the Holy Land trying to sort of m- move the, the, the Muslims out. Uh, and, and in doing that, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of Jews living there already, you know, quite, quite happily uh, under Muslim control, albeit at that time. But uh, along went all of these people from the West and, and suddenly became sort of enemies of these people, and, and to be honest, they probably deserved it at that time. But the Templars were formed really as an ambassador group. Their, their job was to, was to go over and kind of hold the peace. So they really became ambassadors in a mixed cultural environment. Uh, and, and they came under a lot of criticism from the church. I mean, the, the Western churches, the Catholic church, really came down on them like a ton of bricks because they were seen to uh, associate and do business with Jews and Muslims in just the same way that they were with Christians and whatever. Uh, and, and the ideal, really, of Templarism in, in the first instance was much like the ideal that we all strive for today. I mean, simply to, to sort of respect and honor uh, various cultures and religious beliefs and whatever, and to get on uh, well with each other. And they were trying to do that, and they actually succeeded within that particular environment. But but the, the, the Western governors didn't like it too much because, you know, the, the, it was really why the crusade happened. They went over there to sort of crush anything that wasn't terribly Christian. Uh, and it seems to me that, that whatever base this comes from, whether it comes from the Christian end of things or whether it comes from the Muslim end of things, there's always been this tremendous arrogance that, that's gone on in, in as much as that we've wasted a hell of a lot of political and business and monetary time deciding that we, we should spend our hours trying to convert everybody to, mm-hmm. to our point of view. And, and yet, you know, I mean, the, the, the beauty of the world and of world culture is that it has different points of view. And this adds color to it all and, uh, uh, and, the and makes it rather exciting. And well, yet we try to quash you. it. The interesting thing about what you're saying is that we're kind of at that position again in the world now. Sorry? 
I mean, there's a great deal being said that the con, you know, the challenge between three major faiths is the future oh, of the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's the, the the difficulty to understand it is something. You know, I mean, I've never really quite comprehended what's at the bottom of this. It's to do with power bases and it's to do with control. It always has been. Our guest currently, Sir Lawrence Gardner, who is a wonderful esoteric historian, has written many books, some you have probably read, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, the most recent, Realm of the Ring Lords, and others. And and before I forget, Sir, Sir Lawrence, you are working on a film, are you not? Uh, yes. I, in fact, it's, it's forging ahead with enormous speed, actually. It was sort of announced in the Hollywood Reporter last week. Oh, how wonderful. Five months ago, it, it didn't even exist. Well, tell us what it's about and, and how you're going about making it. Well, what, what happened in the first instance is I, w- I was contacted directly after a radio show um, by a Los Angeles film company. And they said, you know, we, we love the, the subject matter you've been talking about here and we'd like to option this last book for a film. And this is Lost uh, Secrets of the Sacred Art? of the Sacred Art. Uh-huh. And, and what actually happened was that having done it, it, it caused an amazing stir in, in the sort of film and publishing world because generally it's novelists that get film book deals, you know? Right. People who write stories or biographies or, or human experience uh, adventures and things like that. I mean, not people like me who write... I suppose what is a, a sort of popular type of textbook, and I, I thought, well, how on earth is that going to be a film? Anyway, what happened was that in about six weeks flat, the, the, the investor interest in it became so great that, that, that it suddenly moved into script writing stages, and my other three books got optioned as well. How interesting! So, <laughs> wow. so we're now at the stage where we have a film script just about completed in a sort of an editing stage. Um, casting is scheduled for the next, probably for next month, actually, I think, as far as I can see, and and the shooting schedule is for February or March. So, I mean, within a year, it it will have been a book, a published book, a film option, and and then a film shooting. Um, Well, it's 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 a remarkable story, yeah, if you could share with the audience that didn't hear our interview on it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's actually based on the scientific aspects of Lost Secrets of the Sacred Art, which we, we spoke about last time. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot in there um, uh, that deals with parallel dimensions, uh, superconductivity, time warps, and, and things like that. So at, at a sort of science fiction end, it's, it's based on that. It's an extension of the fact in, into a science fiction type story, but it's actually a, a grassroots a, a thriller. And it, it, it really revolves around the San Diego DNA crime lab. Mm-hmm. And um, they set up the crime lab there a, a, a few years ago, and they've been c- collecting DNA samples from, from, from all over, and just about everybody that get, gets hauled in anywhere now has their DNA imprints taken, and that gets sent off to San Diego. And this young chap who gets pulled in in, in San Diego for breaking and entering is hauled into the police station. He hasn't actually stolen anything. Short interview, gets released on a $1,000 bail, and his DNA um, sample is taken. What happens is that shortly after that, there's quite a furore started because it turns out that he's got exactly the same DNA imprint as the Turin Shroud. Uh Uh, And um, so the story begins from there. Suddenly, Uh the politicians, the scientists, everybody are wanting this guy. They want to know who he is, where he's from, what he wants and then they can't find him, and, and the story really begins from there, and it's really a, a science fiction thriller from that point. Oh, it sounds wonderful, looking looking at the bloodline, but the the part that, that you are in a unique position, and I keep saying that because it's really true, there aren't many human beings who have a grasp of esoteric history to the depth and level that you do, who are also involved in the modern-day arena of very serious change in governmental affairs, as you are involved in the European Union. Um, and as you described for us, looking at the laws and the constitutions of all these sort of fellow members, what concerns you about what's happening when we contrast what we already know about groups who had real focus on service to humanity, who got wiped out, be it the Templars or Rosicrucians or others, and then groups that seem to be homogenizing economies for greater and greater consolidation of power, but not greater ethics. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding here, and I, I see it all the time on the Internet, and I hear about it from various people. That they seem to want to link up um, groups of the past with, with business groups of today, and, and just to be really honest, that there's no actual link, you know. I mean, just because... 
somebody in government control might be a, a, a scout leader in his part time doesn't mean that the scouts are, are, are an esoteric group that, you know, trying to control the world. It doesn't work like that. So most of it is a sort of back to front thing. You know, Freemasons get a lot of stick because various yes. people in high places happen to be Freemasons. Well, it's the other way around, really. They just happen to be Freemasons. Right. You know, but, uh, it doesn't really work in as much as that that unit is trying to, to gain control. The, the, the old orders, I mean, the, the chivalric institutions, the esoteric orders, were mainly scientifically based. In the majority of cases, they, they grew up in what might be called the Age of Enlightenment, the, the Renaissance era, um, great societies like the Royal Society, when science suddenly reared its head in the 1600s and the great inventions all started. And this began a, a group of people who were, I mean, they were called enlighteners in the first place. They were enlighteners to people. Uh, and then they became called Illuminists in France. And, and this word Illuminists has now been changed to Illuminati. And, and suddenly the Illuminati are this weird group of, 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 of secret doers. And, and they really don't exist, to be honest. I mean, I've never... Well, we'll be uh, back for more with Sir Lawrence Gardner after this. Oh, let's see. I, I love these titles, Sir Lawrence. The Noble Order of the Guard of St. Germain. I mean, I don't know anybody else. <laughs> well, I could say, oh, yes, they're in the Order of the Guard of St. Germain, or uh, anyway. Uh, and, and what you've been sharing with us, though, I think is really rudimentary to the fact that for some reason we as a humanity seem to allow our civilization to be dragged down, you know, into like sort of the pits of mayhem based on political power and military armament, versus elevating our society to a civilization worthy of being called a human civilization. Yeah. I mean, the, the great shame of it is it's rather like corporate politics on an in-house basis. You know, the, the big shame is that it, it wastes time. So much infighting, so, so much uh, political intrigue going on that, that actually if we spent all of that time and energy actually doing the jobs that everybody was supposed to be doing, right. we'd be way ahead of where we are now. I mean, it's why people like scientists and others tend to be reclusive and hide away. They just don't want to be bothered with all of that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they, they forge ahead in medicine and things. But, but, but politically, you know, the, their discoveries can take <clears throat> 10, 15 or 20 years to come to any fruition because everybody's arguing about it. And so those, those are the bits that, that hold us up. And it, it's, it's really, it, it's all about who's going to get the credit, who's going to finally have the control and the power and the say in these new things. Um, <clears throat> People are always asking me, you know, what can I do about it? They always say that, you know, what what can we do about it? What do we have to belong to? And, and the fact is that, you know, one doesn't have to belong to anything except the human race. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does one do about it? Well, you know, I, I'm I'm doing everything that I can do about it. And the only thing that we can do is to shout as loud as we can and, and to try and make our presence and our feelings felt, you know, to those people who are supposed to represent us and manage our affairs nationally and internationally so you know, i write books and i speak on the radio and tv and do all of this sort of thing now, a lot of people can't necessarily do that but but within their own communities and, and their own groups they can certainly do it and word of mouth is brilliant a brilliant way of spreading any philosophy or any thought pattern and use of the internet these sort of things are, are terrific these days and, and we found recently in britain i mean suddenly there's been a great resurgence of student um movements and and, and and we the marches have started up again All what what do you attribute this to Pardon? what do you attribute this to i i think it's to do i i think it all went away i mean it was here in the 50s and right. the 60s and the early 70s and then it disappeared and it actually began to disappear at a point in time when unemployment started to rise mm -hmm. quite considerably and through, then the 80s came, and the 80s was very much a me sort of period. You know, everybody was out for themselves and never thought too much about the, the neighbors next door. Um, I, I, I think that so many youngsters grew up in a period where father was out of work mm -hmm. and, you know, granddad hadn't worked for a long time, that w once they got a job, they became so scared of losing it that they were towing the lines. I think what's happened now is, is that that period has passed. I think people are waking up, and I think they're thinking there's actually more important things than that because this job should be a better job, um, if only. And it's the if only that, that we have to make noises about. Uh, and so I, I, I just see the resurgence to do with nothing more than it's reached a break point where people have said, well, 
towing the line hasn't got us anywhere. Right. There's, there's more to life than a paycheck. Yes. And, and what are the trends you see? I mean, when we look around today, and one of my guests pointed out, you can go to any bookstore and you can, in 10 minutes, pull down a book on teachings in Buddhism, in Taoism, in yeah. Judaism, Muslim, Christianity, Templars. I mean, there, there is so much information really available to a seeker. Are we supposed to, to see this as I mean, how do you view it? Because you can't look back in history and find another time period that was like this. No, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, having said that, you know, one has to be a little bit careful because, you know, in as much as there are lots and lots of books about various subjects, you know, I I mean, I I use lots of books in my research and I have to read all sorts of other people's work because I'm asked about it all the time. Right. And, you know, clearly within it there's the credible stuff and and the not-so-credible stuff. One has to be a little discerning i suppose um but i mean i i I like the 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 fact now and i think again the internet has had a lot to do with it anybody i mean you're there in in america i'm here you know i talk to people in an hour's time in new zealand and australia it's all so easy now Mm -hmm. and people of like minds and like interests can get together on the email and whatever it's like they were living in the same street or village and so we've become community orientated again Mm -hmm. we lost it for a long Mm -hmm. long time but the village concept of communities has come back except that it's worldwide it's not confined to a little geographical reason a region and 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 that means that the quest for information has opened up people now do honestly feel that 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 clearly not only is the information there but they they have a right to have it and to get to it and to study whatever they want and And that means that publishers and the media generally have become much more aware of providing this information. And and so, you know, as you say, there is a great glut of books. You know, one can walk into any decent bookshop, as you say, and find shelves and all sorts of religions and whatever. Well... You know, I don't know who has time to read all no, and, and of that. No, and the thing that, it's, it's that is that it itself has become a business, and that interests me and concerns me because then there's mm. this business associated with quote unquote enlightenment, but it's not really enlightenment; it's just more information. So, yeah. if, if you could talk to us a little bit about, I mean, you've looked at these bloodlines and you looked at the Grail, and now you've looked at the secrets of the Ark and have come to some amazing um, conclusions or at least theories. How do you see our society tapping into the wisdom teachings? I mean, in a way that we can see reflected in the world, not in a handful, you know, but but in our places where we all reside and live. I think it, what we have to be very careful of is that, that it's very easy to, to imagine that, that we're all individually on some sort of a quest for truth. And I, I find truth a, 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 a strange word to define, actually, because it, it's, one can't really define what truth is. So to imagine that, that we're going to find truth anywhere is a little bit misleading. What we can always find are facts. Facts is written down, and it's the facts that have been denied to us for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are the kind of histories that I'm uncovering. Uh, the fact that, that histories are taught differently, you know, if one... For example, in, in, in Britain, learns about the Battle of Agincourt against the French in the 1400s and then goes to a French school, the story is different. It's the same fact, but the truth behind it is mm-hmm. different because points of view are different and the vested interests are different. The reasons why it happened were different. And so what I, I, I'm trying to encourage people to do is to look at the various sides and aspects of things uh, and not necessarily to rely on a particular judgment of anything that is given to us by a church or by a particular educational establishment. Now, having said that, of course, to pass exams, we have to follow particular uh, viewpoints and perspectives to, to, to get the marks from the establishment that governs us. But beyond that, you know, having done that, when we can say, well, okay, that, that was yesterday, now I've, I, I, I've got the freedom, um, it, it is, to, is to try and... and Try and get to the root of things. And if, if, you know, if one is going to buy a book about Buddhism, then it kind of makes sense to buy the first book that you read by a Buddhist, doesn't it? You know, not right. by some clever dude who thinks he's reinterpreted it, um, but knows nothing about it really. And these, these are the areas it. I think yeah. we've got to, to be we're very wary of. Well, and, and that's what I meant, that it's become sort of like a marketplace it business. Has. Oh, and, yeah. And it so, certainly has. I mean, it's an area that I find a little bit tricky because... 
you know, I, I'm treading ground that, that really puts me in many, many camps. You know, mm-hmm. I write about different religions. And I don't belong to them all, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I have to I have to be very careful. And, I, you know, I do talk to people. As you know, I, you know, I talk to you and ask yes. you questions in the meantime. You know, I, I try and get a, a perspective. And, and then when I try and put it across in my books, I, I, I never give it as judgments. My, my theory is that... You know, history is not written in stone, but it is written in blood, and it's still flowing. Mm-hmm. That's beautifully put. Our guest currently, Sir Lawrence Gardner, who is a wonderful esoteric historian, has written many books, some you have probably read, and the most recent, Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, which you will sometime find in the movie theaters. And, and is it, what's the title of the film going to be? Well, who, who knows? Film titles are a bit like book titles. Well, whatever you think they're going to be called a week before the event, <laughs> they get changed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's currently under the working title, The Christian. I'll right. be updating that as the story goes along over the next few months. Lawrence, again then, when you look as you have at the, at the known history but untold, or that's not the right word, recorded history but not one that's taught often, as you have traced with the bloodline of the Holy Grail, and now with your wonderful exploration of the Holy Ark. Is there a direction that you see these great world traditions moving? I think probably, yes. I, you know, it, it, it's been difficult to ascertain, but, but I gradually, I'm finding now, w- with the movement that seems to be fairly worldwide, there's much more of a requirement for, for honesty in learning and in teaching and, and whatever. You know, there's no point in us trying to get through life on, on, on the back of a whole load of, of misinformation and disinformation. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, the requirement now is, is, is to get it all straight from the hip. And, you know, I've been, been trying to lead that for, 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 for some time. And gradually, you know, I mean, I, I had no idea in, in 1996 that Bloodline of the Holy Grail, of all controversial books, would become course reading in our colleges and universities. But it now has. How wonderful. And though, that's the sort of thing that begins the change. Um, it, what happens is that you're offering choice, and it's choice that we seem to have been denied. I mean, even back to the Inquisitions, heresy was the big charge, and the word heresy in Greek was choice. That's what it means. Mm-hmm. So it was a charge for wanting choice. One was persecuted and executed for wanting choice. Well, I think the requirement for choice has reached a head now. I think it's becoming pretty full-blown, and the choice is being offered. What we have to do is now to be very discerning about how we apply the choice, because it even can come to us in some uh, pretty unscrupulous ways. Well, I want to thank you again for the diligence of the way you go about doing your research and and just the beauty and the joy of the fact that you are so interested in sharing it with the world, because there are sometimes really wonderful esoteric historians, and they do wonderful things, but you never hear about it. So thank you for really making a difference in the world today. Lawrence Uh, Gardner, you're welcome. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Kortner. Our engineer is Noah Dankner. I'm Dr. Zohar Hieronymus, and we hope you enjoyed the show.